This page was created to teach black history. Unfortunately, the American educational system was designed to exclude our real historical account. So we are here to dismantle it. It's time to enlighten those of us who have been kept in the dark. I am a black man who didn't know enough about my own history. So I began to dig deeper and do my own research. Black history is American history. So I want people of all races and cultures to join together to learn our history as one. Here, I will share all of my findings. Please like, follow, share, and subscribe to Teaching Black History. The story of Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker was born on November 9th, 1731 in Baltimore County, Maryland, to Mary Banneke, a free black, and Robert, a freed slave, who died in 1759. There are two conflicting accounts of Banneker's family history. Banneker himself and his earliest biographers describe him as having only African ancestry. None of Banneker's survivor papers describe a white ancestor or identify the name of his grandmother. However, later biographers have contended that Banneker's mother was the child of Molly Welsh, a former white indentured servant and an African slave named Banika. The first public description of Molly Welsh was based on interviews with her descendants that took place in 1836, long after the deaths of both Molly and Benjamin. According to that story, Molly purchased Banika to help establish a farm. A biographer suggested in 2002 that Banika may have been a member of the Dogon people, who several anthropologists have claimed had an early knowledge of astronomy. Molly supposedly freed and married Banika may have shared his knowledge of astronomy with her. The biographer suggested that Benjamin acquired this knowledge from Molly as Benjamin was born after Benika's death. A WHO in 2006 reported an analyst of records related to Banneker's family tree was unable to identify any documents that showed that Banneker had a white grandmother but could not rule out that possibility. Unverified accounts that first appeared in books, genealogists published more than 140 years after Banneker's death relate that, as a young teenager, Banneker met and befriended Peter Heinrich, a Quaker who later established a school near the Banneker family farm. These accounts state that Heinrich shared his personal library and provided Banneker with his only classroom instruction. Banneker's formal education, if any, presumably ended when he was old enough to help on his family's farm. Around 1753, at about the age of 21, Banneker reportedly completed a wooden clock that struck on the hour. He appears to have molded his clock from a broad pocket watch by carving each piece to scale. The clock purportedly continued to work until his death. In 1788, George Ellicott, a son of Andrew Ellicott, loaned Banneker books and equipment to begin a more formal study of astronomy. During the following year, Banneker sent George his work calculating a solar eclipse. In 1790, Banneker prepared an ephemeris for 1791, which he hoped would be placed within a published almanac. However, he was unable to find a printer that was willing to publish and distribute the work. After returning to Ellicott Mills, Banneker made astronomical calculations that predicted eclipses for the inclusion in the almanac for the year of 1792.
David Wittenhouse, a prominent American astronomer, almanac author, surveyor, and scientific instrument maker, who was at the time serving as the president of the American Philosophical Society, confirmed the accuracy of Banneker's work, stating, I have examined Benjamin Banneker's almanac for 1792 and am of the opinion that it is well deserved the acceptance and encouragement of the public. He stated that it was a very extraordinary performance considering the color of the Arthur and that he had no doubt that the calculations are sufficiently accurate for the purposes of a common almanac. Every instance of genius amongst the Negroes is worthy of attention because their suppressors seem to lay great stress on their supposed inferior mental abilities. Pemberton then made arrangements to print Banneker's Almanac. In addition to the information that its title page described, the 1792 Almanac contained a tide table for the Chesapeake Bay region. That edition and others contain tables listing the times of high tides or the methods for calculating high water at Cape Charles and Point Lookout, Virginia, Philadelphia, and other locations. The title pages of two Baltimore editions of Banneker's 1795 Almanac had woodcut portraits of him as he may have appeared. However, a biographer later concluded that the portraits were more likely of an idolized African-American youth, supported by Andrew, George, and Elcott, and heavily promoted by the Maryland and Pennsylvania abolitionist societies. The early editions of the almanacs achieved commercial success. On August 19, 1791, after departing the federal capital area, Banneker wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, who in 1776 had drafted the United States Declaration of Independence and in 1791 was serving as the United States Secretary of State quoting language in the declaration. The letter expressed a plea for justice for African Americans. In his letter, Banneker accused Jefferson of criminally using fraud and violence to oppress his slaves. Banneker never married. For reasons that are unclear, the four editions of his 1797 almanac were the last ones that printers published. After selling much of his home site to the Elcotts, and the others. He probably died in his log cabin nine years later on October 19, 1806, at age 74.